codependency is a dysfunctional relationship with yourself. And it's manifested typically with other people. How old were you? <laughs> Ricky Lake. Yes. Uh, Shout out to Ricky Lake. Exactly. <laughs> Welcome to Recovery Soapbox, sponsored by Brighton Recovery Center. We are here today with psychotherapist, author, addiction specialist, sex addict, alcoholic, and codependent in long-term recovery, DJ Burr. Um, Really glad to have you here today. Thank you for coming and joining us. Thank you for having me. I looked on your website, and uh, you have some brilliant adjectives. I do. <laughs> you, do, you do. You're uh, you're quite the. You're a good author. You, I, I enjoyed reading a lot of. You have some one liners um, that really stick out, and I just want to delve right into. It. It's awesome. You you were describing addiction as insidious, sneaky, crafty, and vicious. Oh yeah, uh, those are great. I mean, I, I think of um, you know, I'm a twelve step guy, and some of the way they're described in there, um, but. I love those words, insidious, sneaky, crafty, and vision. And then you also have said one of the better things about what recovery is that I've read. You say recovery is about filling that God-sized hole in your soul with love, fellowship, compassion, and empathy. Yes, that's how I live every day. It gives me goosebumps. That is awesome. Thank you. That is seriously like... Recovery is about filling that God-sized hole in your soul with love, fellowship, compassion, and empathy. Um, really well articulated, well said, and obviously well done. That's, that's a great way to put it. Thank you. DJ, tell us a little bit about your story. Tell us who you are as deep as you want to go as far back. Um, tell us about you. Okay, I'll do that. So uh, as you said earlier, I'm DJ Burr. I'm a psychotherapist in Seattle, Washington. I'm originally from Marietta, Georgia, and I've been in Seattle uh, coming up on eight years. And um, I run Able Counseling Services in Ballard. Uh, it's a neighborhood um, not too far from downtown. And I specialize in uh, treating problematic sexual behaviors or otherwise known as sex addiction. Also other behavioral addictions like uh, codependency or relationship addiction, um, problem gambling, and tech technology addiction. And I also work with folks who are dealing with compulsive uh, spending or debting. And I have a a real interest in working with uh, male survivors of sexual abuse and assault because I am a survivor. And so all of the things that I treat are all things that I've dealt with. And so I bring my experience, strength, and hope to my practice and to my clients, along with my clinical knowledge. That's fantastic. So being raised in the South, a black man and a homosexual, that's right off the bat. Scary. Yeah, (laughs) very much so. (laughs) Yes. Um, Can you speak a little bit about what, just your story, to what led you to this? I mean... Well, you know, I grew up in the projects uh, in Marietta, Georgia, and uh, I never felt safe as a kid. Uh, My mom worked uh, two, three jobs at a time. My stepdad was an alcoholic. Um, I had a younger brother and sister I had to take care of. And while trying to parent these younger kids, I was also dealing with the knowledge of of being different. Um, I had always known I was different. I just didn't know what it meant. And so when I came to understand what uh, homosexuality was, I was like, yeah, that's me. And it was a Ricky Lake episode. (laughs) How old were you? (laughs) Ricky Lake. Yes. uh, Shout out to Ricky Lake. (laughs) Exactly. I think I was probably in like second or third grade and she had a guest on. And, you know, I totally related with the guest. And that's when I realized that I am this word, gay, right? Uh, And based on what I saw on the show, it didn't seem real safe to be gay. And so I kept quiet and I struggled. Especially not in the South. No, not in the South. Not in the African-American community at all. Yeah. Yeah. You just didn't talk about it. You you didn't. Still struggle, I would imagine. I mean, I can't relate, obviously, but (laughs) still. (laughs) Yeah, it it was definitely a struggle. And so um, I kept my mouth shut and I suffered in silence. Um so I struggled with depression, anxiety, 
and um, had a lot of trauma growing up. There was a lot of abuse in my house, um, a lot of domestic violence. And so dealing with all of that while trying to be uh, an adult, right, as a kid, I, I was parentified at a very young age. I, my sister was born when I was six. Wow. So having to step in in this parental role was pretty daunting by itself. But then I had to show up to school, do my schoolwork, and also hide the fact that I was gay. Overwhelming. Yeah. And so um, I became really vulnerable. You know, um, I couldn't trust anyone. I, I didn't really want to be seen because I thought I would be rejected. And um, that actually happened. When I came out at 15, I was rejected. And it left me even more vulnerable to a predator, a child predator, a, a child uh, predator in my neighborhood. And uh, yeah, he groomed me for a sexual relationship. At 15? Yeah. Well, by that time, I was 16. Um, yeah. And I didn't know that that was bad. I thought, here's this man who's, who's giving me love and attention and affection, exactly what I needed for my family. And I wasn't getting that. So I'm assuming that uh, at some point drugs and alcohol came into play as a solution and a symptom to all these other things. Absolutely. Um, you know, he and I, he had this on again, off again sexual relationship with me until I was 18. And then at 18, um, I'm out, I'm in college, I have a relationship. Uh, and then he, he raped me uh, in college. And after that, I turned to to sex and alcohol to numb that pain. I just didn't understand that that's what I was doing. Wow. So at what point, how long did all this go on, your addiction? At what point did you get start to get clean? Or maybe what, what was the turning point? So the turning point for me was uh, I'm in marriage too. Uh, so I'm like 30 years old. Um, I'm in Seattle. My husband at the time, um, I thought was an alcoholic and I encouraged him to get treatment. He said no. And then he went on a bender and he, uh, he physically assaulted me. And I told him, I said, I'm leaving if you don't get treatment. So he went and got treatment. And while he was in treatment, I spiraled out of control because, uh, my own codependency, and co-addiction to him. And so I went to seek therapy and my therapist was like, you're an addict too. And I was like, what? <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> what are you talking about? I fought my whole life to not be an addict. I just got my husband into treatment. I am not an addict. Exactly. And he said, you need to go to a meeting. And I was like, I'm not going to a meeting. And after a few weeks, I went to uh, a code of, no, I went to uh, Al-Anon first. Because you weren't an addict. Right, exactly. I wasn't an addict, so I went to Al-Anon, <laughs> and that was scary. And then he said, you need to go to a Codependence Anonymous meeting. So I went to a Codependence Anonymous meeting and broke down because they had this, uh, this list of pa patterns and characteristics, checked all of them off. That was me. It was like that followed me around my whole life and took all my patterns and characteristics and put them on a piece of paper. That was probably, a, I mean, the beginning of getting better, though. It was. It, it truly was. And just three months after that, I wound up in a sex addiction uh, treatment uh, group, uh, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. Can you speak a little bit to, I mean, the trauma and how that relates to the sex addiction? Sure. Um, you know, being uh, sexualized early in my life... Um, by pornography, I found pornography, and then being uh, groomed and molested and then raped, uh, all of that was tied to sex. And sex is natural and normal, but my view of it was distorted. And along with the, the physical violence that I had in my life, the spiritual abuse, the mental abuse, it was just too much for, for my young self to, to handle. And so I engaged in what I call codependency. I use other people, places, and things to numb that pain. There's a lot going on. <laughs> Appreciate your honesty. Oh, always. And uh, coming on here and sharing all this. It's 
this is what recovery soapbox is about is digging into these things so that hopefully we can we can help um with codependency uh i think there's a lot of misconceptions with it and i think you can help clarify on it i think so my understanding of codependency i hear all the time working in this industry is oh i'm codependent but it takes two does it not or can you can you speak a little bit about codependency and what that looks like so it does not take two. Okay. So see, I was missing fraud. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people are. Codependency is a dysfunctional relationship with yourself. Mm. And it's manifested typically with other people. Um, so you can be codependent all by yourself, right? I could be sitting here right now with you and judging myself harshly because I think you might be doing that, right? That's codependence. I don't, it doesn't matter what you think about me. It truly doesn't, right? You just met me. You know nothing about me. You're learning. You're learning. You only only know what I'm telling you. Yeah. But in my codependent brain, I could be spiraling out and it could be impacting my self-esteem because I don't know what you're thinking about me. Now, five years ago, I'd be a mess right now. Now, I'm just here. I'm calm. What I wonderful freedom that comes with recovery yes yes to, I've... to not carry that crap of our own twisted thoughts and assume that maybe that's what others are thinking right i think <laughs> i mean do i have moments where the codependency flares up absolutely and then i have to check in with myself what am i not doing for myself to to take care of myself right did i get enough sleep did i eat uh am i angry and not you know expressing any boundaries Right. Uh, Am I not uh, communicating effectively? Those are the things that leave me vulnerable to the codependency. But the fact is, it's always going to be there. I've accepted that. Well, hearing you describe it, I realize that there's I mean, there's thoughts that I have that are that are codependent in nature. I need to dig in and look at some of those more with my therapist that I recently started (laughs) seeing. (laughs) I'm always amazed and I refer to it a, a lot, but in recovery, how the horrible things that happen to us end up being gifts and attributes to other people when we get this right. Yes. You clearly, in the little bit that you've shared, have, and you, you can feel it from you, you went through some crap. Yes. And you didn't always handle it right, but through the, the gift of willingness and recovery, you now are using all those experiences to help others. So then those experiences are no longer horrible right. they're, they're lessons to help others mm-hmm. that's true and because i'm helping others and talking about my story often i still have like uh triggers um i still have nightmares right um because what i went through was traumatic and it requires ongoing work like, i still go to therapy i still go to my meetings uh i have two sponsors i have four sponsees you know, I'm a member of several uh, 12-step groups. I have to continue to do my work because I know what it's like to be suffering. And suffering is optional. That's great. Good one. Suffering is optional. Yes. For sure. You speak a little bit about, you spoke about your story. Um, So I just wanted love. Yes. My memoir. I just wanted love, recovery of a codependent sex and love addict. I like the cover of that too. You got the the twelve step on the bed with yes. looking out the window. You know, I told the the you know the designer. I said, "This is what I want," and I got exactly that. And I love how it turned out because that's how it was for me. You know, I when I first got into recovery, it was scary. And so, like I said, I did Al Anon and then Codependence Anonymous, but I was still acting out sexually. I had no idea that it was you know connected. And so when I got into SLAA, I got some awareness. And so there were times where I was just, you know, suffering internally because I couldn't act out in that, in that major drug, which was sex. You know, um, that was so powerful. I, I never want to be in that space again. At what point did you realize you could write a book? I mean, not everybody writes a book and has it published, um, but yet a lot go through what you did (laughs) yes yeah so at at what point i mean what was the the creative process the inspiration to say you know what i can do this and i can put it so there's something interesting about my book that a lot of people don't know i started writing that book in college after i was raped 
because at that point in time, I thought that my life would be over soon. And I was always writing uh, ever since I was a kid and I wanted to leave, I wanted to leave something behind, right? Yeah. And so it did start out when I was in college and I put it away. And when I got um, into recovery, I found other memoirs of people who were uh, in addiction recovery and it inspired me to, to pick it back up. So I took that, the, the, the material that I had written in college and continued writing the story of what happened. And then I got an editor where we put it together with what was currently happening in my life. Um, it was challenging. I'm sure. I mean, there were times when I would just break down and cry. There are times that I look back and still I read, I read the book and I'm like, did that really happen? Because it's so far fetched, but it did happen. All of it. And I'm here to tell it. It's amazing that you were able to, to get it out there. And then I was reading some of the Amazon reviews and for anybody that has uh, suffered or knows someone that's suffering um, from either, I mean, whether it's uh, sex abuse or codependency or all the things we've been talking about, check out, I just wanted love. Um, the reviews, I went to them and they're amazing. I like, know. They're, they're <laughs> so, um, several of them talking about how much it helped them and that they didn't think anybody, there was uh, one that had written that um, how much you had helped and that she read the first nine chapters and like the first day. And that's really yeah. Cool. And then, so what a healing process for both you and for the readers, because when you write things, I think that's why when you go to treatment, we have them write their autobiographies. Like when you're writing, mm -hmm. you're processing in a different way. So what a cool thing to do. Thank you. That's really, so you talk a lot about symptoms as well. Yes. Can you speak a little bit about the symptoms of addiction? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you know, Addiction surrounds us, right? You know, I don't know one person who doesn't know someone who is struggling with addiction in some capacity. In some capacity, and so for me, what it looked like, um, you know, I let go of all the things that I enjoyed. You know, I spent most of my time uh, captivated by my various addictions, whether that was porn or uh, pursuing sex outside of my relationship or uh, dating right? Spending money I didn't have, right? Just so I could feel good about myself. And really, that's what it's about. It's like, I need to feel good about myself. And I can't do that on my own. So I need something or someone to do that for me. Right. And so what I tell people is like, if you're spending the majority of your time numbing painful emotions, you might want to talk to someone about that. Right. Um, if you are using all of your time, uh, in doing these unproductive pursuits, right? Like you're skipping out of work, you're, you know, missing your kids play, you're not connecting with your partner. You might want to talk to someone about that because addiction will take over your life. It absolutely will. And you know, we in recovery, I've got four years. Wonderful. And, um, still in early recovery, but what I see creeping in now at the four year mark, and I, I noticed on your website about the coaching and at four years and thrivers, I think you called yes. it. Yes. Um, I find those behavioral relapses, at least I'm aware of them, but the thinking and then whether it's, you got to be real careful of those because those, that happens prior to. Mm -hmm. sure. So, I, and if you don't take those steps and go to talk to someone. So for me, what it looked like is I just recently, I'm seeing a new therapist Good. and along with, um, you know, the steps are an evolving process for me and but it, the behavioral aspect can you speak a little bit to that like because you can be in recovery and still be sick like from the drugs and the alcohol yes you can be a, what i call a dry drunk yeah right just because you stop drinking and that doesn't mean that you're in recovery right you yeah. might be abstinent but Maybe you're not going to as many meetings as you need. Maybe you don't have a sponsor. I know so many people who don't have sponsors in recovery and they're still acting out in their addictions in various ways. And so thinking that you have figured it all out is a symptom, right? You need to talk to somebody. You need to get a sponsor. You need to work the steps. And the thing about the steps, they can be worked in a day, really. 
you know, they were designed to be worked quickly if you follow the AA Big Book. You can do the first three steps by nodding. <laughs> <laughs> you really can. Yes. <laughs> that is true. That That's is why so, four comes with right. pretty wretched grump, yeah. punch of write down anything. <laughs> that is so true. Like I did back to, back to the basics of recovery um, a, a year or so ago, and I've taken people through that. Is that the in 24 hour deal? I mean, in a one day? Yeah, in a one day. I've heard of it. I haven't. Yeah, I love it. I highly recommend it. Um, the steps are meant to be worked frequently and, and, you know, often, right? So in 27, you bring up a point that I, I didn't have down on my notes, but I want to talk a little bit about it if you're, you're willing. And that's, uh, clearly the steps are a part of our journey, but when you look at the traditions, we don't seek attention through press, radio, and film yet here we are doing this. I think in 2017, I can't say what Bill W would have thought, but I mean, in one of his LSD ramps out in the <laughs> woods, he may have utilized this in a little different way. Cause I think you can have anonymity and protect it, but then also share the message. Can you, what are your thoughts on that? You know, this is something that I, I have struggled with because I think it's important to share the message. There are so many of us out there suffering and that's because we don't have the information. And so we don't have the information because people aren't sharing it. And for me, I heal through talking about my addiction and my recovery. And so I think it's important to get the message out there however I can. Now, I'm not, you know, paid by by any of the 12 step groups to talk about their fellowships. Um, I only talk about based on my own experience in those yeah. fellowships and, and I'm not calling out anyone else in, in, in their work in the fellowships. It's all about me. And I get to choose what I want to remain anonymous about. I, I love that. And I agree with uh, wholeheartedly. I think that if we're not speaking up, it, though a lot of healing goes on in the basements of those churches, True. Uh, let's speak up a little bit and bring them out into the light because there's a lot of, to be learned and gained and shared. And it's not, I think initially when you look in the 30s and 40s, it was to protect um, the anonymity because it was needed, right? And then to also, when you look like, if you go and relapse, it's not AA's fault. No. Or essays. Absolutely not. So to, so in 2017, I think it's far different than 1937. And I'm glad that there's forums like this where, where we can we can talk about Yeah. If that. I If I were to relapse, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a whole, that'd be a probably an interesting podcast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, it started when I was a kid though because people um they talked behind my back, they bullied me, and what I would always say is I don't need anyone else to tell my business. I can tell it myself. And that has stuck with me. So, you talked a little bit about um you know, people aren't talking about it. You're talking about a lot of tough things that are tough. I mean, all the time, um, whether it's abuse uh, from rape, um, the healing from those things. These are things that I think viscerally make people uncomfortable. Yes. And I like that. Me too. <laughs> Way to ch And so, um, yeah, I think the more we can talk about it, the more we can bring healing and hopefully get to a place where you're not making fun of, but where you can laugh like you just did. I think that's the end goal. At least it is for me. I want to mm -hmm. be able to to heal from it in a way that I can f feel good, right? Yeah. So Journey On is a podcast that, that you do, and it's specifically talking about those things. Can you speak a little bit to yes. what, the, what the purpose of Journey On is? So season one of Journey On was called uh, Journey On uh, Male Survivors of Sexual Abuse and Assault. I thought it was important to have a space for male survivors like myself to tell our stories. And in, and in fact, the very first episode was my story. And I talked about the abuse that I suffered. And I also talked about what the recovery was looking like. And um, in fact, uh, I re in October of 2016, I finally turned, uh, I reported the abuse to the authorities back in my hometown of Marietta, Georgia and told them the name of the person who abused me. Now, I knew very well that he was not going to get in trouble. They weren't going to go arrest him. The statute of limitations had, had lapsed. And in the state of Georgia, 16 is considered the age of consent. So even though... He, even with an adult? Absolutely. 
he was 45 years old. I was 16. And so there was nothing that could legally be done, but I wanted his name in a database in case it ever came up again. Yeah. How backwards is that in the South? The prejudices that come with homosexuality, race, and then yet the age of consent is 16 with a 45-year-old. It's yeah. okay. But you know what? That It's oh all over the country. Gosh. I mean, people are advocating for changes all over the country around the statute of limitations. It's happening everywhere. So it's not just in the South. So what I have provided is an outlet for people to come and share their stories. And a variety of stories have come uh, through on season one about their experiences, strengths, and hopes. And I think it's important to share that. Now in season two, which is going to premiere in the fall, I'm, I've am i asked women to come forward and share their stories too. I think we should just have an open forum for men and women to talk about their experiences. I think it's important for everyone to have an opportunity to share. So Journey On is probably one of the best things I've ever done. It's great work, and I love it. Yeah, and it's it's unique because, again, those subjects you're delving into, sometimes the things we need to hear the most probably are the most uncomfortable to hear. Yes, yes, And absolutely. we can all learn from it and to gain awareness whether we've uh, experienced that trauma ourselves or we have a lot guaranteed. What it, I, I think I read on your website, one out of six? Yes, one in six men have experienced sexual abuse by the age of 18. Of those, I wonder how many just keep it hid and... Most of them. Wow. Well, it's really great work you're doing. And then you have a second podcast. Yes, Making an Addict. Yeah. I like that title. Thank you. Yeah, I, I kind of stole it from Making a Murderer, which is like one of my favorite Netflix <laughs> shows. <laughs> I'm combining them and making an addict murderer. <laughs> no, but you know, no. It, that that show really, you know, for me, it really captured uh, all the different things that influence how people show up in the world and the things that are uh, that impact them. And so when I was watching that show, I was like, hell, I, like there's so many things that are that contributed to me being an addict. What would that be like to talk about? It's great. Right. So I invite people on my show, whether they're uh, another recovering addict or a family member or professional to talk about their own thoughts and opinions about what makes someone an addict. We have great time having these discussions. You know, everyone has an opinion and I love to hear opinions. And this is the space to hear it. And we live in a place where it's easier than ever to be able to to share those stories. Yes. As far as Journey On goes, uh, has it been difficult to find people willing to come on and talk? Um, somewhat. You know, doing this work, you know, I'm a therapist full time and, and being a podcaster part time for two shows, which is probably like another full time job, right? That takes a lot of time to go out and cultivate those relationships. So that's probably where most of my time is spent trying to cultivate those relationships. But once I contact someone and say, hey, I see that you've been talking about uh, childhood sexual abuse on Twitter or on Instagram or wherever I find them, they're interested in sharing their story. So how would somebody reach out if they were moved by anything we're saying and wanted to reach out to you and possibly if they had a story they wanted to share, how would they get in contact with you? The best thing that people can do is go to my website, djburr.com. And there's a contact uh, form there, or they can email me directly, dj.burr at ableseattle.com. And you also have ableseattle.com as well, right? ableseattle.com, yes. Um, on there, you, you speak about a, a coach versus, I mean, therapy, not versus, but I noticed, I mean, you're a recovery coach as well. I've never seen it uh, done the way that you have it there. You have a riser, a survivor, and a thriver. Yes. I liked it. I like the idea of it. I mean, because we all struggle at different points right. in, in recovery. I mean, year four, it's way different for me than it was year one. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> I'm at year five and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know if I can keep doing this because it's hard, right? Yeah. We have to keep evolving. And so that's why I kind of broke those uh, stages down because we need different treatment at those stages. We need different coaching at those stages. And, you know, I love the 12-step fellowships, 
but the experiences that I've gotten um, myself personally and from what I hear from my clients is that they're not getting exactly what they need from sponsorship. And I think that's uh, in part because there's really no template for sponsorship, right? No. Take the person through the 12 steps. Okay, but there's so much more than that, I think. And so that's where I come in as a recovery coach, kind of supporting what they're currently doing. That's good work. Thank I you. mean, so when you say riser, it's early recovery, like six months to a year ish, or I'd say six months to maybe two years, and then thriver two years to four, four and or then five. Yeah, I have, I have some close friends um, who are at the four and five year mark along with me. We got sober together, and we've stayed and you know become close friends and year four i don't know what it is but i heard it from lacy who I, I work with and she's does the podcast she's going to do one today women in recovery but she said from four to five was the hardest and i'm experiencing some serious the same thing like yeah the, behaviors and, and thoughts that weren't there self defecating mm -hmm. thoughts yeah. and negative self-talk which hasn't been there for me it, did you experience that too and i'm experiencing it now how do you coach when you're speaking those things <laughs> like, <laughs> mindfully yeah 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 it's really about being mindful you know i've spent a lot of time trying to uh build a relationship with my addict because for me, I truly think that the addict part of me is really the scared kid not wanting to hurt anymore. And so uh, it wants to use those old tools. And what I say to, to my little kid is, you know, I have different tools now. I understand that you're scared. Let's talk about it. Yeah, I've said, uh, thanks for sharing all that. I'm going to take you to a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe two meetings. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And... We can't stop with those things. Mm. No. I mean, sometimes I'll ask, uh, you know, what do you need right now? And what I might hear back is a nap. Yeah. Just like the basics, right? The basic self-care. A nap is something I could do. For me, my personal space, what it looks like is a good reflection. Like if I, something as simple as making my bed, I, you know, in treatment, I started doing that. And then in my sober living, like if my personal space, if it's getting, it's like, oh what's going on yeah yeah what's going on mm -hmm. um so you're you're a psychotherapist or lcsw or no lmhc okay and it's so the how are you doing i mean when you think of time management and then self-care because i'm fascinated by someone that has so much on their plate <laughs> two podcasts a partner um Looking to adopt kids, I heard. Yes, it. yeah, you heard that too, yeah. That's that's on the agenda, it's happening. That's great. And you'll meet with Cameron later, you'll be able to talk to him okay. about that as well. Um, is there a technique you use for getting it all done? My calendar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I really, you know, sometimes I ask myself, am I doing too much? And if I am, then I look at my calendar and, and move things around. And I build in self-care. You have to. You, you have to. And so I block out times. I mean, there are times I don't want to leave my house because I haven't watched Netflix in a week. Yeah. Right? So I want to watch Netflix, and that's what I'll do. Um, but I have uh, – I started riding a bike to work. I sold my car, so I'm getting plenty of exercise now. Nice. Um, I see friends regularly, talk to people regularly. That's all part of my self-care. I think the only thing I haven't done recently that's part of my self-care is get a massage. So I'm working on that. Self-care is critical. It is. When you don't, and I, I noticed it because, I mean, with everything that's been going on with me, and I think the, it was kind of a selfish question, and I'm just reminded of what I already know. It's making sure that you're you're helping, but then also making sure, like service is critical. But Yes. But making sure you're taking time to take care of yourself. Right. It, it's it's critical. Um so we talked a little bit about the behavioral aspect, but are your clients that you work with, uh, obviously without talking about them specifically, but do you, are they mainly people that are in new recovery, early recovery, out of treatment? What is it? Most of my folks are brand new to recovery. Um, I do have some folks I've worked with for like maybe the last three years. I've been able to support them since the day they walked into the rooms. In fact, it was me who said, 
you need to go to a meeting just like my therapist did five years ago. So uh, walking that journey with them is amazing. But uh, primarily, a lot of young folks are coming in. They're coming in struggling with sex addiction, which involves porn. Porn is destructive, in my opinion. Um, It does nothing but fry your brain. And so I get a lot of men coming in talking about, you know, how porn is uh, destroying their lives. And so I help them with that. Um, I don't have a lot of females right now, um, but that shifts, right? Um, But the men, they're working on uh, addiction recovery around porn, codependency, relationship issues, and um, they're doing great work. At what point, I mean, the destruction of porn, in a sense, in my recovery, porn it's part of just being in recovery, not not looking at it, but, but abstaining from it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, I mean, meth is a big part of my story. And as you know, you can imagine that yeah. incorporated a lot of uh, uh, pornography. Yep. But I guess, uh, can you speak a little bit about at what point that you, things are destructive? Like, because if you, let's say if you have some money and you go buy something nice, like I like nice shoes, I'm not going into debt to buy them. Right. But um, at what point... Is it an issue? I think it becomes an issue when you start experiencing negative consequences. And a lot of people are fearful of bringing consequences. But the fact is, consequences are natural and normal, right? For instance, I was on the bus last week, and there was a guy watching porn on the bus. And I'm like, if you can't contain your porn usage, you have a problem. And I'm not sure there's even healthy porn to be on it maybe no. with maybe with your couple like with your love like maybe there but i don't it's just destructive it is destructive i mean porn knows no bounds it really doesn't there should be a shirt yes porn knows no bounds i love it <laughs> i'm gonna put it on a shirt I, lo- I like that a lot um is there anything that you would share for somebody that maybe i mean that secretive nature of abuse, um, you know, it's easy to be quiet. It's not easy to be quiet, actually, because that's when the, it's... But we're feeding for, the shame and addiction when we're quiet. How does somebody step up, whether they're, they're age 18 or they're 20, maybe they've even been, th- and they haven't really talked about... Because if they don't get to those core issues, if they don't get to the trauma, right? they're going to use again. They're going to use again. Right. I mean, it's those co-occurring underlying issues. Yes. So how do how do people talk about what, it? Yeah. What advice would you give for someone struggling? You know, I think most of us have that one friend who we trust. And I think if you go to that person and, and ask them if they can hold something in confidence and if they can just listen. And if they say yes, tell your story. Right. Yeah. You don't need to be fixed. That's not the moment to go call the police. That's just the time to listen. And I think we all need that one person to listen. And from that point, we get to decide what we do next. We do all need that that person to listen. Absolutely. I think that's why therapy Exactly. Works. And so if you don't have that person, uh, let's say you're really isolated, you can find a therapist. Uh, therapists uh, now are you know providing treatment over the phone on um, online platforms, right? Um, there's resources available. Boy, in that isolation, that's a symptom for me too. Yeah. I'm not, right? If I'm if I'm not getting out of the gym and I'm not doing it, if I find myself, for as much as I enjoy something like you said, the Netflix or whatever, boy, if I'm isolating, check myself. Yes. That isolation is the first one. And I've given my friends permission to call me out if they see anything going sideways. Right, because I trust them. Yeah. Right. So if I if I'm not calling you and checking in with you, um, call me. Say what's going on. Right. Yeah. Is there anything that I missed or that you'd like to share? I think you've gotten everything. You you're think? Just, yes, you've done great. Well, I'm gonna do a, a summary. I want to I want to wrap this up. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to love is a, a I have not read it, but based on the reviews. Um, if you're struggling with anything that when it comes to any kind of sex addiction, abuse, um, boy, what a resource. And so you can go to djburr.com. Um, there is a lot of information on Able Seattle. You can order the book there. I would encourage you to reach out and listen to Journey On. 
and making an addict not making a murderer or it sounds like making a murderer is pretty good as well (laughs) check both out and if you like what you hear and if you um please rate us if you rate us we would appreciate it only if you like it if you don't then why are you listening (laughs) stop now Uh, we would appreciate positive feedback but uh, dj thank you for taking the time to share and thank you for the work you're doing talking about those things that are not always easy. Well, thank you for having me to here. talk about. This is Josh Hall and DJ Burr signing off from Recovery Soapbox. Thanks. <laughs>